All right, folks, we've got to talk about something important here. It is very important that you never, ever, 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 and so on and so forth, by the way, ever, 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 ever watch this channel without subscribing. Okay? Come on. In case you did not catch that, people, that is our page where we've just got an entire page of Evers, which is our readings for this week. Welcome to Woeful, Woeful Wednesdays. This is Nathan Reads, a series of unfortunate events. Ignore the tattoo. I'm Nathan. And I'm Tyler. Um, so if you are new to this, what we're doing is I am reading through, uh, well, we're reading this together. We're reading through a series of unfortunate events. I have not read these books before, so this is my first time. I am clearly the wrong age to start reading this. <laughs> Um, I'm just the wrong person, but we're doing it anyway, because why not? Um, you loved these books when you were a kid, and uh, yeah, I was too old for them when they first came out anyway. Like, I was already I was already too old when they first came right. out, so there's nothing I could do. Uh, but I I know they're very, very popular, um, so that's why I'm doing this, to, to go through it. So basically, this is a series in which we're going through the books and we're reviewing and commenting and pointing out different um, interesting bits from the, the books. And we're doing this in three parts for each book. So there's 13 books, so three videos. So it ends up being 39 videos total is what we're going to end up making with this. And this is a book number two or book the second, The Reptile Room, chapters nine to 13. Now, we do have a sponsor for today's podcast. So our sponsor, I'm very proud to have them sponsor the podcast. It's so great to have them be a part of this booktube channel. It's amazing. It is curtain booger removal. Let's be honest, folks. We all use our drapery for that purpose because who on, uh, who else would, uh, wh why else would you want to do anything besides using your curtains for blowing boogers into just like Count Olaf does? Uh, That's what they're there for, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're just giant hankies hanging in your room. <laughs> Who on earth would use tissue or Kleenex? I don't think I can say Kleenex because that's a brand name and they haven't actually sponsored the podcast. Right. But we've got the better one, people. We've got the <laughs> curtain booger removal. So after you've really used up your curtains, then you want to use this product to make them ready for your nostrils all over again. Curtain booger mm -hmm. removal. Get yours today. <laughs> yes, very thankful to have them. And of course, everyone who's listening to this needs this product. It is just, yeah, it, it should be a household item. Every household needs to have this. Yeah, but, I can't believe they even need to advertise. It just seems right. like these products would sell themselves. But yeah. <laughs> All right, folks, I hope you enjoy. Ignore the tattoo! Nathan unfortunately reads a series of unfortunate events at an unfortunate age, which in this case is being used to indicate that he is entirely too old to be reading this for the first time. All right, so we're talking chapters 9 to 13 of Book the Second, The Reptile Room of a Series of Unfortunate Events, written ostensibly by Lemony Snicket, but really written by Daniel Handler, because Lemony Snicket is just a persona. So, um, I'm going to do the plot summary briefly for these chapters. Basically, where we're at at the beginning of this is uh, Uncle Monty, he's already dead. Dr. Lucafont has arrived very quickly, very suspiciously. He, how, It's very suspicious how quickly he arrives. And you've got Stefano, really Count Olaf, who is continuing this ruse that he's actually Stefano, and you've got Mr. Poe, who continues to fall for it. And they are quibbling about how they are going to get the kids and their luggage, all of their personal belongings, in these two different vehicles with a dead body and all of this, and it is quite the debate. They, they really seem baffled by how to do this, which is... Um, being used for comedic effect but uh that goes on for a while <laughs> <laughs> yes yeah well it, it, it keeps coming back to it that's the right it's not even that thing. it goes on for a while it's that yeah we continue to to return to that that argument uh that they're yeah. having the debate and it's kind of out of this debate that they're so busy with this that the kids end up figuring out uh, different ways of being able to alert Mr. Poe to the fact that Stefano is actually Count Olaf. So Violet goes up to uh, Stefano or Count Olaf's room 
and she sees the booger curtains and everything else. And then she gets the out. Or is it the outlet or is it just like the plug from the lamp that she's then able to devise into a rudimentary lock pick? Yeah, I believe it's just the the plug. But yeah. Yeah. So she she gets that goes out. Um, is he, is able to open up his luggage and then finds these things in there with a syringe and the venom and things like that, brings this in, and Klaus has been able to determine that the... What is the name of the snake? Uh, the... Oh, what is it? The uh, Mamba du Mal, I think? I guess. Yeah. I think you're right. The Mamba du Mal. And uh, he's able to figure out that if that snake actually killed uh uncle monty then uncle monty would have very dark a very dark hue but he mm-hmm. doesn't he's very pale so they're able to kind of use all of this together to show mr poe that stefano is actually count olaf and then sunny is developing at quite a rate because she's able to see through uh Dr. Luca Font's disguise and see that it's actually the hook handed man and nobody yes. else can see this. And yeah. uh, so anyway, so she bites his hand and it pops I'm... off to reveal the claw. Yes, I'm I'm convinced that in Lemony Snicket's universe, the younger you are, the more intelligent you are. It sure seems to be that <laughs> or way. Or at least doesn't the more it? intuitive. <laughs> it really seems to be that way. He just the, the yeah the adults are just complete dolts and the children are so smart including sunny that when you're in that pre-language stage of development that's when you're most insightful right <laughs> yeah. um so i think that's it i think i covered it right and i guess by the end then you know count olaf and the hook-handed man they they run off and then mr poe is like all right i'm gonna have to find you um a new family right mm-hmm. yes and new, yes new uh, yeah you uh he says you children can't chase after him i won't allow you um well then why don't you go after him uh they're too far gone <laughs> it was that and yep. he had another excuse too what was it that oh it's right like... he said that he couldn't leave them alone <laughs> in the he... house with the reptiles yeah, he couldn't do that, and also, I forget what he said, he had so many excuses, because it was also, I think, that he's, like, too old. Um, right, yeah. yes. Yeah, chasing after people is <laughs> is a young man's game. Yeah, no, he says, a grown man, Mr. Poe said uh, sternly, does not get involved in a car chase. This is a job for the police. Sure. I'll go call them now. So good thing the police are not grown men. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, I don't understand that. It's like a grown man doesn't chase after people. That's a job for the police. Well, who the hell are the police? Are they toddlers? <laughs> <laughs> the most intuitive police force. <laughs> That's right. That's The detectives are the toddlers. And just the regular, you know, beat cops. Those are like, I don't know, maybe like five or six year olds <laughs> right yeah yeah um, um yeah but I, I i think that about does it and of course all the reptiles are going to be uh shipped off to different places yes and this is devastating yes supposedly uh <laughs> the baudelaire children this is devastating yeah all right so let's start with chapter nine um do you want to switch it up and we go through your points first and then i'll talk about mine uh sure all right so uh the first point that i have uh on page 127 um and i feel like you uh want to talk about this anyway uh it is now necessary that this is a uh the paragraph at the bottom there it is now necessary for me to use the rather hackneyed phrase meanwhile back at the ranch The word hackneyed here means used by so, so many writers that by the time Lemony Snicket uses it, it is a tiresome cliché. Meanwhile, back at the ranch is a phrase used to link what is going on in one part of the story to what is going on in another part of the story, and it has nothing to do with cows or horses or with any people who work in rural areas where ranches are or even with ranch dressing, which is creamy and put on salads. (laughs) Yeah. So we get a double whammy here with his definitions. We do. And also 
who in the like how is meanwhile back at the ranch a hackneyed expression i have meanwhile, no idea sure but meanwhile back at the ranch i don't think i've ever seen that in a book <laughs> other oh. than this one well i mean it's from old westerns like old tv shows yeah and i mean i'm familiar with the expression but i just right. yeah it, yeah i mean unless he's talking about like screenwriters and teleplay writers right I, yeah <laughs> I, yeah like i i don't know uh <laughs> but yeah. yeah i had that marked as well and i just <laughs> i just wrote okay with ellipses points <laughs> Like, yeah. all right, I get what you're doing. I see how you're just going to continue to hammer this joke that you're insisting. Like, this is a hackneyed phrase. So isn't it funny that I'm using it because I've now established that I'm not a hackneyed writer. Hackneyed writers use it, but I guess I'll use it anyway, kind of ironically, which is so much of these books. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I do. I do like his definition of the word hackneyed used by so, so many writers that by the time Lemony Snicket uses it, it is tire. It is a tiresome cliche. I kind of like that. He I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I, 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 I think it kind of works. And then also the reference to ranch dressing, I think, is just. Yes, <laughs> that's works. a fun little turn. It is yeah. a fun little turn that he starts messing with the definition of it. Uh, yeah, I just, I feel like it's just, it's such a transparent thing that, you know, mm -hmm. comedy writers can kind of use, but I feel like it's a lazy joke to right. say a bad comic would say this, and then they right. make that joke, <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? And it's kind of like a little, excuse me, I'm going to use this lame joke, and I'm going to say it's lame, and if people laugh, then that's great, you got the laugh that you wanted, and if people don't laugh, then you say, well, I told you that it was lame. This shows my knowledge of the the genre. Yeah. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, all right, so the next point that I had was on page 131. Um, uh, and yes, this is, of course, talking about... Uh, how disgusting Count Olaf leaves his room. Um, uh, just at the top of that page, the curtains over the windows uh, were all bunched up and encrusted with something flaky, and as Violet drew closer, she realized with faint horror that Stefano had blown his nose on them. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's just kind of uh, really hammering home that... Uh, Count Olaf is disgusting. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah, uh, I don't know what to even make of this other than we've established that he's that gross. It's just, I feel like, I, I don't know. I, I really want to ask you this question. Do you feel like Lemony Snicket is making um, Count Olaf, basically for a, a kid reading this, it's like, wow, my gross brother does that. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yes. That it's like yeah. no adult. I can't imagine any adult. No matter. There's a lot of gross adults. You know what I mean? There yeah. really are. But I still can't imagine an adult doing that. But I can definitely see a kid doing that. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes. So, like, do you think he's putting this stuff in here? So then kids will identify that and go, ew, he's so gross, just like my little brother. Yeah, uh, I, I could definitely see that. I, I do think that um, that he is embellishing what uh, <laughs> um, yeah, embellishing what the truth of this story would actually be. As in, Lemony Snicket is embellishing um, how oh. bad Count Olaf would be. Um, okay. I mean, because it also talks about like all the uh wine bottles uh the the half drunk wine bottles there um yeah half, half empty wine bottles and it's just well when did he have time to drink all of these he's only been there for like one day good point <laughs> he brought his empties with him <laughs> and but they're half sitting empty. outside in the hallway making sure that the children didn't go anywhere so he didn't even get drowsy yes another good point <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so maybe is this just like he's just not thinking, or is this that we're supposed to then presume that he really is um, exaggerating? Yeah, yeah. So I I interpret it as him 
uh, exaggerating because, of course, he wasn't there. He doesn't know exactly, you know, what these scenarios looked like. Right. I would presume. <laughs> right. As much research as he does, like, I think that that is just something that is like, yeah, I can imagine this. So, sure, he's that disgusting. Okay. I'll go with it. <laughs> um, all right. That was all I had for chapter nine. Did you have anything that I missed there? Um, I think so. Um, and in case anybody missed that, then I now have a cat on my lap. So it's a little bit harder <laughs> to follow along here. And you can't quite see him. I, I would turn the camera down so that way everybody can see how cute he is. But um, then he's going to be upset because I'm going to have to get up to do that. So you're just going right. to have to trust me that we might get some uh, purring picked up on the mic here. <laughs> he's getting pretty comfortable. Um, yeah, so I did have that passage marked where I said, OK, uh, the next one is on page 128. And he says this is like the starting with that paragraph in the middle of the page. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, Violet went to listen at the kitchen door, trying to catch what the adults were saying. As I'm sure you know, the key to good eavesdropping is not getting caught, and Violet moved as quietly as she could, trying not to step on any creaky parts of the floor. Okay, I want to keep going with this, but I want to point out, so what he's doing is he's saying, he, he's not presuming that kids are innocent, he's presuming that they absolutely, um, you know, spy right. on people, <laughs> and they eavesdrop, and he's saying... You guys know what I'm talking about, and you know how to do this. You know how to do it well. And it's this clever little thing because it's then implying that if you don't know how to do it well, I'm going to show you how to do it really well. Because then saying she had she moved as quietly as she could, trying not to step on any creaky parts of the floor. When she reached the door of the kitchen, she took her hair ribbon out of her pocket and dropped it on the floor. So if anyone opened the door, she could claim that she was kneeling down to pick it up rather than to eavesdrop. This was a trick she had learned when she was very small, when she would listen at her parents' bedroom door to hear what they might be planning for her birthday. And like all good tricks, it still worked. So children, if you did not know <laughs> how to eavesdrop on your parents and how to, if you do get caught, how to be able to easily get out of it, this is how. So he's kind of having it both ways. He's saying, you guys probably already know how to do this. Like he's saying, I'm sure you know how to do this. And some kids are like, I don't know how to do this. And they're like, right. by the end of this, a minute later, they're like, now I know how to do this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, yeah I, I'm not sure uh, what, what yeah, else it's to not say. The, it's not the only instance of him uh, teaching uh, children lessons that are probably not <laughs> what most parents would want their kids to be taught. <laughs> right, exactly. Um, um, all right, yeah. then the, the next one, and I just thought, like, this genuinely made me laugh because you, this is on page 132. So Violet is upstairs in the bedroom, right, in Stefano's or, or Count Olaf's bedroom. And so I'll just mm -hmm. kind of pick up with that last sentence of that paragraph. Disheartened and afraid she had spent too much time in Stefano's bedroom, Violet went quickly back downstairs. No, 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 Mr. Poe was saying when she stopped to listen at the kitchen door again. Dr. Montgomery can't drive. He's dead. There must be a way to do this. <laughs> <laughs> the fact that that was even a suggestion is so yeah. great. <laughs> They're like, well, what if Dr. Montgomery drives? No, no, no. He's, he's a dead bud. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Because it works so well because you're essentially getting, it's it's almost like what you would have in a film of like a little edit. And now you go back to them because it's establishing that they are in the midst of this debate still that they're still right. arguing about this. And it's just absurd that these adults can't possibly figure this out. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, yeah, and, and it works because we have established just how ridiculous these uh, adults are. Correct, yeah. If this is not the stupidest thing they've done. <laughs> right, yeah. Um, and then on the, the next page, on page 133, then it says... Um, Klaus is unsure of the the words, the definitions of words. Oh boy, he's on the keyboard. That's never good. <laughs> All right, you get down, buddy. So Klaus is, is unsure. Po there? <laughs> yes, that is his name. For for those of you who are watching, that is Edgar Allan Poe because he's all black, all black, and I enjoy <laughs> Edgar Allan Poe. So, uh, but yeah, we don't call him Mister Poe. Maybe mm. we should. Yeah, you might have to start after this series. <laughs> yeah. 
So on page 133 at the bottom, then Klaus is unsure about the meaning of these words. So um, Violet says, you know, I have no idea what you're talking about. Because she says strangulatory, conjunction, uh, tenebrous, hue. And then he says, I didn't either, Klaus admitted, until I looked up some of the words. Strangulatory means having to do a strangling and then so on. And I just in exclam like with an exclamation mark, then I wrote, yes, look up those words. But I think that this functions as a, a didactic text and didactic means a, a text that is like a teaching text, right? Mm, uh, essentially yeah. functioning as like teaching you a lesson. Um, yes. And so I feel like these books have been didactic in that sense of teaching children how like what these words mean by them providing you with a definition but then saying hey if a writer doesn't give you a definition and even from context clues if you still can't figure out what the definition is you can also look it up because right. i've done this enough times in the classroom where I, I show students especially when i'm teaching french um because i teach french as a second language and so i'm trying to show my students if you don't know what the word means instead of their immediate resort is ask me what it means and then I show them, you have multiple steps before you ask me, right? Yeah. Which is, I'm fine with them asking me, but I say, you got to go through multiple steps before you get there. And it it's functioning to me as a didactic text because it's then saying, this is an option, kids. You can look up the words, individual meanings of words to be able to, to learn what they mean. So I was happy to see that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, very good point. Uh, yeah, no, I, I, I do think that that works. Uh, much better than some of the other uh, <laughs> definitions that we've got in because it is, yeah, very clearly saying that this is how Klaus knows all these words that he is offended when people, you know, assume that he doesn't know. It's right. He's looked all these up. <laughs> yes. And yeah. Um, and now for the rest of the book, I've only got a couple notes for chapter 10 and that's it. So, oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, so... In chapter 10, uh, top of page 142, this is the other moral that we get. The story's yep. moral, of course, ought to be never live somewhere where wolves are running around loose. But whoever read you the story probably told you that the moral was not to lie. This is an absurd moral, for you and I both know that sometimes not only is it good to lie, it is necessary to lie. <laughs> so, I mean... I don't know what to make of this. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad that you brought this up because I'm about to end this man's whole damn career. Um, <laughs> now, I don't really mean that. It's fine, but this has kind of been my, my point so far with the books is that he is con he is presenting these books as being so edgy and so, um, you know, oh, this is not appropriate for children and these are such dark stories and I'm going to teach them lessons that seem like you can't tell that to kids, right? And I'm just going, uh-huh, sure. <laughs> like, sure, this is edgy. Sure, like you're doing something original here. So uh, this is, so the story that he's, he's talking about initially is the boy who cried wolf, mm -hmm. right? And then saying that, the story's moral, of course, ought to be never live somewhere where wolves are running around loose. But whoever read you the story probably told you that the moral was not to lie. This is an absurd moral for you and I both know. What does he say? For you and I both know that sometimes not only is it good to lie, it is necessary to lie. And then it goes on. All right. The classic children's literature, um, children's book, Harriet the Spy by Louise Fitzhugh was, as I'm pretty sure, was first published in 1964. Okay. Everybody knows Harriet the Spy, like whether you've read it or not, you know the the title, you know the name. Yeah. Have you read Harriet the Spy before? I have not. So I've still got my notes from Children's Lit. I took Children's Lit in university, so I did take an entire course on Children's Lit. So as much as I say, I don't know what I'm talking about with Children's Lit, it's, I, I don't. I did take one course where I read something like 50 like children's books. So right. <laughs> like, like a lot of them were novels, that, you know. Um, so it's not like they were picture books. and um, But I still feel like that hardly qualifies me in any way. And this is, in my edition of Harriet the Spy, this is page 278. And this is Harriet's nanny who is, he write, uh, she writes her a letter. Because basically, Harriet spies on everybody. She's eavesdropping. Okay? And she is acting as a spy to see what everybody's up to. Right? 
And then her her nanny ultimately writes her this letter. I forget the reason why she she's not there anymore. Um, but it's um, her name is Old Golly Waldenstein is her nanny. And so she says she gives her two pieces of advice. Number one, you have to apologize. Number two, you have to lie. And then this is what she says. Otherwise, you're going to lose a friend. Little lies that make people feel better are not bad, like thanking someone for a meal they made, even if you hated it, or telling a sick person they look better when they don't, or someone with a hideous uh, hue, sorry, or someone with a hideous new hat that it's lovely. Remember that writing is to put love in the world, not to use against your friends, but to yourself, you must always tell the truth. So essentially, you need to tell the truth to yourself, but you have to lie to other people because that's actually the better thing to do in in many cases and it is a challenging a challenging uh, lesson to teach children to overtly tell them your problem is that you tell the truth you need to learn how to lie right because yeah. and i i think and i i remember thinking about this very carefully at the time because i had not read it until i was like 20 or something in university and reading this for the first time that I thought I realized so much of manners, so much of being polite is lying to people. Right. Hey, it's so nice to see you. It's often not nice to see that person, right? <laughs> yeah. It's thank you so much for this great meal, even if you didn't really enjoy it that much. And, you know, yeah. can't wait to see you again. All of yeah. these things. And I've got like a little anecdote with this. So at one point then I, I asked our mom, I, I said, Mom, do you think that it's ever okay to lie, right? And then I gave her this example. And then she, you know, kind of hemmed and hawed and all of that and tried to, like, well, but it's not really lying if you say it, if you phrase it in such a way, basically be as diplomatic as possible in order to make it still sort of enough of the truth that it's okay. And then I said, do you think that Jesus ever lied? So what I... And then I gave her an example. So he goes to somebody's place. They make him a meal. And then they overtly ask him, was it good? You know, Jesus, did that taste good? Right? If they, like, pin him. Right? And then I said, what do you think he he did in that kind of situation? And then she thought about it. And she thought about it. And then she said, maybe that's when he told a parable. <laughs> 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 it's the funniest thing she's ever said. <laughs> right. Yes. Maybe that's what he told the parable. He's just pinned. He's like, no, I'm gonna have to lie. I'm not gonna I'm gonna have to lie. He's like, have you heard the parable of the wheat and the chaff? <laughs> he, just, <Yeah. laughs> he just changes the subject. So my point with all of this is I look at this and I'm like, is this just an overt reference to the classic? piece of children's literature, Harriet the Spy, and that very um, big moment in the book, is that what Lemony Snicket or Daniel Handler is doing here? Or does he really think that he's presenting something original? Uh, right. That this is really, ooh, can't believe you would just tell kids they have to lie. Because she's not being ironic here. This isn't facetious. This isn't tongue in cheek. Because Harriet is going to lose a friend because she's spying on everybody. And then her friends are like, what? You've been spying on me? You've been saying this about me and all of this. And so uh, her, and you know, and her nanny is getting to the point of like, look, that's kind of part of being an adult. Uh, you yeah. don't just tell the truth all the time and say exactly what you're thinking. And we do teach children that. We tell them to at least not always tell the truth. We don't necessarily tell them to lie. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, for sure. I mean, even the classic uh, Bambi, you know, if you can't think of anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. <laughs> yeah, because yeah. kids don't know this. Right. right. Like yeah. you'll get kids like when they're younger, like it, it's so funny. I'm pretty sure it's on Aziz Ansari show on Netflix, Master of None, where you've got he's taking care of this kid at one point and she just does this thing that you've seen kids do like so many times and they're just walking around. And then she goes like, he's fat. She's old. That lady's <laughs> Chinese. And he's like, very observant. Like, <laughs> like what are you supposed to do? It's like, because kids will do that. It's like, it's true, but stop saying it. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, that is. So that is an interesting point. And I don't think that it is particularly um, poignant or, or anything like that. It's just a, I, I, I think that it's interesting that he, 
is saying it all in the context of uh, of the story um, and saying that, oh, the moral that you have been taught about that story is completely wrong. Yes. Uh, and that the moral should be never live somewhere near uh, somewhere where wolves are running around loose. Right. Um, which, I mean, I guess that's a good lesson. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, no, that, so it's it's interesting because he's not really even directly I mean he is directly saying like sometimes it's you know okay to lie but it's this weird kind of commentary on the stories like on these children's stories yes um yeah so anyway uh and then and then he does of course refer to Little Red Riding Hood <laughs> as very dim-witted yes <laughs> He says um, uh, later on, uh, on page 142, uh, the last sentence there, you will recall that the wolf, after being treated very rudely by Little Red Riding Hood, ate the little girl's grandmother and put on her clothing as a disguise. It is this aspect of the story that is the most ridiculous, because one would think that even a girl as dim-witted as Little Red Riding Hood could tell in an instant the difference between her grandmother and a wolf dressed in a nightgown and fuzzy slippers. Yes. <laughs> yes. I, I put, I, re, I marked this and I said, this is very funny, a la Olaf, Olaf's disguise. Um, yes. That of course we know what he's talking about, that everybody should have caught it, especially Mr. Poe. And right. then Snicket doesn't go there because then you get the turn, right? That he, he does a pretty good job of this. Here's the setup for the joke. And you go, I'm ready for the punchline. And then he yep. does this little turn and he surprises you. So go ahead and, and keep going. Yep. If you know somebody very well, like your grandmother or your baby sister, you will know when they are real and when they are fake. This is why, as Sunny began to scream, Violet and Klaus could tell immediately that her scream was absolutely fake. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it's true. It is a little disappointing that we don't get that payoff because it's, it, yeah, it, it it's so perfect. Oh, <laughs> really I actually think that it works so well because you do get a payoff, but you don't get the payoff that you're expecting. He's right. Yes. That's, and from a that's comedy true. writing standpoint, then I appreciate that because what he's doing is this is such an obvious he's he's telegraphing the setup to the joke. It's mm -hmm. so obvious that he spent this whole time. They are the entire thing is. Why can't Mr. Poe recognize that that's Count Olaf? Why right. can't he, when it's so clearly Count Olaf? And then he tells this story of how on earth could this little girl not recognize that her, it was not her grandmother, but a wolf in her grandmother's clothing. And then he goes, mm. you would definitely be able to recognize like your sibling or, um, yeah. right? Does he not say that? Does he not say sibling? Yeah. Your grandmother or your baby sister, you'll know when they're yeah. real, when they're fake. This is why as Sonny began to scream, right? And then you're like, Oh, Violet and Klaus could tell immediately that her scream was absolutely fake. And then you're just like, because it's a funny little thing, because then it's like, right. damn it, Snicket, you don't even know this? You don't <laughs> you, you don't know how to like get, deliver the punchline? You're not seeing the connection here between Little Red Riding <laughs> right. Hood and Count Olaf? Like, you don't get it? So then we get to be in on the joke, and we're like, huh, I'm smarter than Lemony Snicket. <laughs> right, yes. And in this instance, we are smarter than Lemony Snicket, but we're not smarter than Daniel Handler. Right. Yes. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, I no, really very, appreciate it. I point. thought like this entire thing I thought was great, even though like mm. I, like this, of course, I was being facetious before, like saying like, oh, he's not doing anything original here, edgy with because hey, Carry the Spy does it really well. I'm mm -hmm. saying he's playing with stuff that's pretty well established and then yes. taking it in surprising directions. Yes. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. And that is uh, the strength of these books as we continue to go through them, uh, as he sets up his own um, structures and then breaks yes, them. Exactly. Um, yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, all right, so the next point that I had was just uh, on page 146. There are two basic types of panicking standing still and not saying a word and leaping all over the place, babbling anything that comes into your head. Mr. Poe was the leaping and babbling kind. Like, 
of course he was. <laughs> you know, like, of course he said. Right. <laughs> um, and I just, I really, uh, I, I really enjoy all of his um, exclamations. It's so, it's so odd that he decides to say, blessed Allah, Zeus and Hera, Mary and Joseph, Nathaniel Hawthorne. <laughs> yes. So, uh, yeah, thank you for bringing this up because this is great because he's basically blaspheming in a variety of religions, like a variety mm -hmm. of gods. And so, the okay, because there's a couple things here. Because goodness and golly are euphemistic for it's don't take the Lord's name in vain within yeah. the Christian tradition. So then these become euphemisms, replacement words. So you say golly instead of, or golly or gosh instead of God, right? Right. Yeah. And, and so then it's like, oh, I'm not really blaspheming. And then a lot of people will say, but you are, because the intention's there. Whether you say the word or not, the intention is to blaspheme. And then he just yeah. keeps going, good God. All right, well, now you've taken the Lord's name in vain. And then, yeah. oh, I'm going to like do the same thing with Islam. Blessed Allah. But he says, <laughs> blessed Allah. Okay, so, so you get good God, blessed Allah. And then Zeus and Hera, all of those ancient <laughs> Greek people are going to be very offended. Uh, Mary and Joseph, to, to cover you know christianity proper in case good god wasn't specific enough <laughs> right and then nathaniel hawthorne the great american writer um <laughs> yes and now i do you have any theory about why he chooses nathaniel hawthorne uh so i i don't know much about nathaniel hawthorne i just know that he is uh a very well-known writer but i can't even name one of his works okay um uh, but yeah, no, just like this idea of um, uh, my assumption is don't ever say anything negative about him. He's perfect as a writer. Oh, yeah. OK, that's maybe one way of viewing it. I didn't quite go in that direction. So Nathan Nathaniel Hawthorne, uh, his most famous work is called The Scarlet Letter. OK. With, oh, yes, uh, of course. Yeah. yeah. And, and Hester Prynne is the protagonist of this. And it's a 19th century book, which gets taught all the time. And when I took American Lit, then my professor described it like the structure of it and like the, the way it, it plays out that it's perfectly structured um, with this symmetry to it. And in some way, so maybe there is something to the, the perfection that Nathaniel Hawthorne <laughs> right. achieved with The Scarlet Letter that is one of the great American novels. But I think what it is, though, is that it the book's taking place even though he's a 19th century writer it's taking place in the puritan era america where this woman so and puritans of course would care about taking the lord's name in vain right. so it's like by invoking the name of nathaniel hawthorne and then to me it's like you should think about the scarlet letter so then you should think that was a puritan society where they'd be very very offended by this book and specifically by <laughs> right. that passage so is that what you're trying to do to to invoke kind of puritanism out of mentioning Nathaniel Hawthorne. But then the other thing is that the protagonist of the book, she has to wear this red A, right? This scarlet mm -hmm. A everywhere she goes because she has been caught committing adultery. So mm -hmm. everyone in the community has to know the sin that she has committed, that she is forever stained by this. And yeah. then you get to point to her then say she's sinned and then it's like and then you get the turn so it's like now by you judging her you have sinned so it's kind of a commentary on the entire community that they're constantly sinning by judging her which is an interesting thing that Hawthorne's doing so it's just I don't I don't know what to make of it other than like that's his most famous novel which definitely has to do with us pointing out that person's a bad person uh, sorry about that so our connection got cut off for a minute there so I'm saying I don't quite know what to make of this whether he's just pointing out the references to this Puritan society or whether he's trying to get us to think about Hester Prynne and how the entire community looks at her and judges her and then says, she's a sinner, she's a sinner, she's a sinner. But by doing that, then they are then judging her, which is, you know, essentially like saying, like the, the Christian, the, the scripture in the New Testament that Jesus gives a parable about, there's the speck 
in your neighbor's eye, like you're pointing out mm -hmm. the speck in your neighbor's eye. Meanwhile, you've got a plank in your own. And essentially, it's by pointing out the sins of others, you are now enter you're acting as a judge, right? And, you know, of course, you get the judge, not lest you be judged. It's like, don't judge other people. So I feel like maybe what he's trying to do there with this is saying, you're now going to judge me as being a bad person, a bad writer for including all of these blasphemies in my book. So right. I've now blasphemed in multiple religions. So we're now going to say, you're a bad man. And then it's like, I'm judging you, though. So now it gets turned around on me. Hmm. Um, and I don't know that that's what he's doing. I don't know if it's just supposed to be a random. I'll just, you know, it could have been Herman Melville, you know, another <laughs> right. 19th century American writer. Like, I don't know. Uh, but I'm trying to give a couple theories there. Yeah, yeah, no, I do. I, I, so I do think that there's something to it being um, uh, blasphemous to uh, to bring Nathaniel Hawthorne's name out in vain. Um, and <laughs> yeah, I just feel like it's something where it, perhaps it could have been any other writer, but the fact that there is that connection to the Scarlet Letter, I think, makes it even stronger. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. So uh, that's all I really had to say with that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, I just, uh, I, I marked it and then forgot to look up Nathaniel Hawthorne before oh, we uh, right. started recording. But yeah, so thank you for, for that. Um, all right. The next note that I had uh, for chapter 10 on page 150, we get, uh, um, we get, aha, Sonny cried again, pointing at Stefano. The incredibly deadly viper blinked its green eyes triumphantly. Mr. Poe looked at Klaus puzzled. What does your sister mean by aha, he asked. Klaus sighed. He felt sometimes as if he had spent half his life explaining things to Mr. Poe. That line is so perfect. <laughs> I, I really love that as well. Like, I like the fact that he just gives up. He just sighs. Just yeah. Sigh, just... <sighs> <All right. laughs> yeah, it's just such a good moment of, yep, you you are going to spend all of this time just constantly having to explain things to Mr. Poe because he does not get anything. <laughs> right. And it is explaining it to Mr. Poe. But I, I do wonder if there's also trying to think of this as children's lit and specifically like children are the demographic that he's going for. That is his, his audience, mm -hmm. like his readership that he he's writing to. And kids, I think often feel this way. Like if you like, yeah. you've got a kid who's, I mean, let's say for instance, when you were a kid, I, I'm, I'm going to kind of pick on you. And if you mm -hmm. want me to, to not, then, then I, I won't, you can just tell me, Hey, stop. <laughs> but okay. how many times as a kid did you have to explain like, Digimon or Bionicles or whatever to like mom or to me or whatever, like maybe not yep. to me so much, but to <laughs> any adult. And then you're like, I've already explained the difference between Pokemon and Digimon. Cause I remember <laughs> like, I would, I would mercilessly yeah. tease you about this. Just, ah, you're playing your stupid Pokemon. And you're like, it's Digimon. It's different. And I'm like, no, it's not. And you're like, yes, it is. And then you would like really elaborate on the differences between Pokemon and Digimon. Cause you had no patience for Pokemon, but Digimon was completely different that yep. I think that's maybe what he's trying to do here, like with Klaus, that kids are like, exactly. You just get to the point where you, instead of trying to explain it, you just say, you keep asking me these things. I keep explaining <laughs> it, but you're never going to get it because you're too dense. <laughs> right. That I think a lot of kids yes. feel that way, right? Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, <laughs> yeah. No, it, it is such a great moment there. I I, oh, I really love that line. <laughs> I and I mean, like, I think that's fair, right? Like, be like with my like teasing, yeah. Because I intentionally, yeah, yeah, yeah. no, for sure. I, I, we, we have. I don't know why, but Amanda was one time. Like our sister Amanda was one time using her video camera, and she was like, "Okay, explain to me Bionicle." Like, and I was like, "Okay, so this is Tahu. He's the fire guy." And I just went off on like this whole thing, right? And it's just. It was important to me, and I could understand this whole thing. And how could you possibly not understand that the it's... red guy was the fire guy? And... <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> and yeah, I mean, so many kids feel that way. Like, I mean, I yeah. definitely 
had that, like, I mean, like my thing, like when I was, uh, you know, basically that age, like I was into Power Rangers. And I remember right. our dad, like, went off on me, like saying how Power Rangers was you know, so inferior to Star Trek. And I argued with him because <laughs> he didn't know Power Rangers the way I did. He didn't understand what the show was about. And <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but kids, I think, yeah. often feel that way. So I think that's what's happening there. I think that's what Handler is trying to do. He's trying to get children to identify with Klaus in that sense. Not so much that kids are so much smarter than adults, but they feel like they are in certain domains. Yes. Yeah, Absolutely. Um, yeah, and I do think that there's also, I mean, we get so many references, uh, or, or so many examples of, uh, of Sonny saying something completely innocuous, and uh, Klaus and Violet are just able to understand her completely, uh, and nobody yes. else can, and so in this one moment, where it's so explicit, right. she said, aha! <laughs> Good point. Good point. <laughs> And it's like, oh, come on, you can't understand what she means by aha. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, so I love that that's like the one time when somebody actually questions that. Yeah. Um, all right, we do, of course, have uh, in chapter 11, uh, or, or did you have uh, a different point? In... I'm good. Okay, yeah, so in chapter 11, we do have the entire page of Evers. Yeah. Um, uh, and then... Okay, so the explanation that he gives, uh, or, or the warning that he gives, is uh, never fiddle around in any way with, uh, yeah, this is on 155, uh, never fit, fiddle around in any way with electric devices. Never. There are two reasons. For it. So, but the whole thing is that she is, as far as we can tell, she unplugged it first and then is dealing I with know. it. And so it's like, well, it's not that dangerous at that point. <laughs> like, there's nope. no electrical current running through it. So you maybe didn't need the whole page of Evers for this particular example. <laughs> yeah. And if kids have not seen that kind of playfulness with the text, you know, oh, yeah. just repeat a word for an entire page, um, then I think it's probably delightful. Like, oh, books aren't supposed to do that. Right. right. Yeah. But, you know, like I say, like, I'm just totally the wrong person for this because it's like, yeah, yeah. I mean, like, I've read Tristram Shandy from, I forget exactly when it was published, but a couple hundred years ago. He was playing with text in far more inventive ways. And, but, <laughs> right. So I'm like, I'm unimpressed, but this is not supposed to impress me. Like, I'm right. well aware. Believe me, people, I'm well aware that this is not supposed to impress me. But for kids, yeah. I can see why that would be delightful. But yes. it is a strange time that he gives that warning. But of all yeah. of the things that they mess around with, he doesn't give a warning about grappling hooks, homemade grappling right. hooks, to yeah. throw them she up a 30 hurts her down. hands, like, while bending the metal. But nope, that's not, yeah. that's not worthy of this kind of warning. <laughs> no, messing around with these snakes. No, don't worry about that. That doesn't deserve a full page warning. But, you know, fiddling, <laughs> fiddling with the plug of an unplugged lamp. <laughs> yeah. okay <laughs> yeah um all right so on page 156 uh then we get the i think fun little uh definition of crude where he says crude here means roughly made at the last minute rather than rude or ill-mannered i like that because it does show that there are two different definitions for that word yeah. um uh, and then I don't have anything until page 161, where we get the whole needle in a haystack uh, discussion, um, which, yeah, I don't even know what to say about it, but it's just, it, he goes on for so long about how there's a difference between looking for a needle in a haystack compared to searching for anything in a haystack. Mm hmm. Um, and but I do like that he um, yeah, he says uh, uh, because once you started sifting through the haystack, you would most certainly find something hay, of course, but also dirt, bugs, a few farming tools, and maybe even a man who had escaped from prison and was hiding there. Mm -hmm. Again, just completely the direction that he 
that Lemony Snicket's mind apparently always seems to go um, to the nefarious. Right. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's the only real comment that I have on that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's maybe also in a, in a way of these books being didactic texts of, you know, teaching children that it's essentially teaching them. I think kind of what he's doing, because at times, this is another instance of we the readers are smarter than Lemony Snicket. We're not more clever mm. than Daniel Handler, but we're going, right. that's not how you interpret a metaphor. When somebody <laughs> right. says it's like finding a needle in a haystack, then he's being very, very literal. It's almost like an Amelia yes. Bedelia type of <laughs> interpretation of it. It's like you're taking this so literally, trying to like, you know, surmise the meaning of it that mm -hmm. like you're totally missing the point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So it kind of yeah. allows us to be a little smug, I think. Huh, right. I'm, I'm smarter yeah. than even the writer. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, that's a good point. Um, all right. So on page 168, then, uh, uh, then we have Violet explaining that she uh, created a lock pit, pick. Um, and then Mr. Poe says, how did you do that? Nice girls shouldn't know how to do such things. And then Klaus says, my sister is a nice girl, and she knows how to do all sorts of things. And then Sonny says, Rufik, Sonny agreed. And I really like that description, Sonny agreed. Like, that we just, mm -hmm. we didn't need to have, you know, which probably meant something about... Yeah. It's, it's very uh, efficient there in just saying Sonny agreed, and then we can automatically interpret, oh, okay. <laughs> and based off of what Sonny ends up doing uh, where Sonny can see through Dr. Lucafont's disguise. It's setting mm -hmm. this up that um, Sonny, I think, is developing. Sonny's getting smarter. Right. Yeah. Uh, that Now Snicket can tell what Sonny means because Sonny does have meaning behind her words. Right. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Or behind her, her garbled words. Yes, absolutely. Um, all right. Uh, then we get a fun little play on things on page 169 where uh, <laughs> where Klaus is trying to explain what strangulatory means and then Stefano interrupts by saying, we know what the words mean. And I just kind of like that little play on, you know, yes. the, again, the, the formula Klaus that does. we have set up. Yes. <laughs> yeah. um, and that it's ultimately um, pride that undoes count olaf here right right yes yeah absolutely it's um, interesting because the kids are pretty prideful as well mm -hmm. and this yeah, is such are. a vice it, it like this is like his own undoing and of course is a tragic flaw then pride is you know right up there um and mm -hmm. so we see this and we go oh he just couldn't help but show off his fancy book learning right right yeah. And that's ultimately what undoes him. And then you look at this and you're like, yeah, but they're not so good at, you know, toning that down, at resisting the urge to show off their fancy book learning. Yes. Yeah, no, that, that's a very good point. Um, yeah. Um, all right. So final chapter. And I know, like, I do want to, you know, wrap this up. Uh, so we get the explanation that Gustav is dead on page 177. Um, Gustav didn't quit. He said in his wheezy voice, Gustav is dead. One day when he was out collecting wildflowers, I drowned him in the swarthy swamp. Apparently everything in this, uh, community, uh, has some kind of, um, it's a Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Then I forged a note. Uh, let's see. Uh, oh, yes. Um, Count Olaf looked at the three children as if he were going to run over and strangle them, but instead he stood absolutely still, which somehow was even scarier. Mm -hmm. um, and then, but that's nothing compared to what I will do with, to you, orphans. You have won this round of the game, but I will return for your fortune and for your precious skin. Okay. <laughs> that escalated quickly. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. No, but I do like that, 
you know, it's it's very direct in this is a series of unfortunate events. And of course, Count Olaf is going to be back multiple times and that it's just kind of, you know, uh, it's a it's a little bit of um, uh, I want to say Scooby Doo, but it's not quite Scooby Doo where it's, you know, mm. like uh, or, or Inspector Gadget. You know, mm. it's it's the Next doctor. Time, plot gadget. And, Next yeah. Time. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. So I just uh, I like that because I mean I love Doctor Claw from Inspector yeah. Gadget. Yeah, I used to be able to do a good impression. <laughs> Next time, Gadget. Next time. Right. Yeah, that's pretty good. <laughs> like, I used to do it a lot. <laughs> I don't know yeah. why. I still like, do it a lot. It's just so much fun. Skill I felt I had to develop. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Which is only going to have like. It's never going to be appropriate to use, but... <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, I actually included that voice in a play that I was once in. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. Yeah, acting. Acting, it can work. Yeah. So. I, I was I was one of the spirits in, in Macbeth. And, oh. Yeah. So, yeah, it worked. Uh, <laughs> all right. Um, so, uh, on page 183... Uh, and this is my second last note. Uh, and we have, um, we have Violet say, who are you? Violet asked, it is confusing to fall asleep in the daytime and wake up at night. What are you doing with Uncle Monty's reptiles? Klaus asked, it is also confusing to realize you have been sleeping on stairs rather than in a bed or sleeping bag. Dixnick, Sonny asked, it is always confusing why anyone would choose to wear a plaid suit. <laughs> I really like that. It's, yeah, again, like, we don't need the full explanation of what she's saying. It's it's efficient and and fun and yes. without dragging down, you know, the, uh, the pacing by including this whole uh, yes. explanation. I agree. I agree. Yeah. Um, yeah, and let's see. Oh, and I also wanted to call out uh, on page 188, going into page 189. Uh, I really like the imagery that uh, that Daniel Handler uh, wrote in here with, uh, it was a full moon and the moonlight reflected off the glass walls of the reptile room as though it were a large jewel with a bright, bright shine. Brilliant, one might say, when Bruce had used the word brilliant about Uncle Monty, he meant having a reputation for cleverness or intelligence. But when the children used the word, and when they thought of it now, staring at the reptile room glowing in the moonlight, it meant more than that. It meant that even in the bleak circumstances of their current situation, even throughout the series of unfortunate events that would happen to them for the rest of their lives, Uncle Monty and his kindness would shine in their memories. Uncle Monty was brilliant, and their prime uh, and their time with him was brilliant. Bruce and his men from the Herpetological Society could dismantle Uncle Monty's collection, but nobody could ever dismantle the way the Baudelaire's would think of him. I just think mm -hmm. that that is very well written. <laughs> yes. Yeah. No, I agree. And he does have moments like this. He does have moments where um, he moves into the sincere mm -hmm. yeah it, it seems to be especially when he is talking about uh the Baudelaire's experiences like their pleasant experiences that he becomes mm. most sincere yes and, yes uh, yeah uh as if he really wants to uh you know harvest those and and really yes. bring them out um yeah, so. that, that's what we should value. That's what we should treasure. And the bad stuff that we go through, we can kind of laugh about. Right, yeah. That's an interesting way of, of viewing this. I want to see how well that holds up with the rest of the series, because you're right. I think there is something to that, that when he is sincere, it is those um, nostalgic moments where, mm -hmm. nostalgic and, and uh, moments where they're thinking about these good things that have happened and these pleasant things. And he seems to be sincere there and not really facetious. But all the bad stuff, then it's like, well, let's just laugh at our troubles. Right. right. Which is not yeah. a terrible lesson. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. Um, yeah. And so that was my final note. Uh, we get the final illustration of uh, Bruce, who is dressed in a plaid suit. 
Although why anybody would ever choose to wear that is anybody's guess. <laughs> yeah. Dick's Nick. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, yes, and so that, that will finish off book the second. Yeah, and then you get the letter to the editor at the end, which doesn't mm -hmm. really give us as much as the letter to the editor with book the first. Um, yes, which I appreciate. <laughs> yeah, me too. Me too. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, basically, I think we're, we're good to move on to book the third, The Wide Window. Mm hmm. As we will head over to Lake Lacrimos. Yeah. All right, folks. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. And next time, folks, next time. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> hey. <laughs> Ignore the tattoo. A phrase here which means like, comment, subscribe, and share this podcast across the web. That may seem like a strange definition, but in this context, it is entirely accurate.